from the studios of Staten Island Community Television, you're watching In the Bleachers, the TV show for the world's most passionate sports fans. Hello, everyone. I'm Jamie Hickson. And this is Hector Bosa, the hardest by the sexiest man on our cable access TV. Now in Dominican Republic with the lovely young, lovely young ladies after me. He's calling from home. He ain't I in the DR. <laughs> ah, yes. Yeah, I'm, in, I, 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 I'm in your place. I'm in your land of the neighborhood. Uh, my parents' land, actually. That's, that's my adopted land. But uh, okay. we are so thrilled that you could join us this evening. It's the first Monday of May, and we're joined by... Two guys that I'd like to consider really good friends of mine. Uh, over here, we've got Jeff Benjamin, who is the unofficial mayor of Staten Island Long Distance Running. And also, we have Michael Schnall, who's from the New York Roadrunners. It's great to see you guys again. How are you, gentlemen? Good. Thank you. Well, Thanks for having us. Thank you. We've got one of the most interesting shows that could probably be presented on television because... The majority of the time, we're going to be talking about some running, but it's not just any running, but there's going to be a really big race that's going to take place this Saturday. How about telling the people all about it? Sure. Um, first of all, thanks for having me, Jamie. Greatly, greatly Thank you for being it. here. You know, the service that you guys do for the community, especially with the sports world, is like phenomenal. Thank Re you. Really Yay, great. we got a plug. Yeah. yeah, you too, Hector. You you do good too, brother. You do, <laughs> oh, thank yeah. you. Thank you. Yeah. I'm just saying we're so glad we got a plug because there's some people that don't like to hear Staten Island sports. Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> believe it or not, there's quite a few of us out there, maybe with a silent majority. So, I hear you. Yeah, but um, the moniker uh, Mayor of Staten Island uh, Track and Mayor of Staten Island Running, I cannot uh, let that pass without giving credit to DJ Excel, the great photographer of local Staten Island running track and field throughout the borough over the past few years. So hopefully, DJ, you're getting a plug here, okay? And you're definitely worthy of it. Um, I'm, I'm a member of the Brighton Kiwanis Club. And four years ago, uh, we saw a need with the Staten Island High School Track and Field Association that they were in a lot of debt. Um, the Staten Island High School Track and Field Association, for those people who don't know, is the uh, only borough where we have a Catholic public cross-country indoor-outdoor track championships. Okay, Brooklyn can't do it. The Bronx can't do it. They just can't get together. We got it done because in the 1950s, the legendary Bill Welsh and uh, John Tobin great coaches, they created the league. And the league has stuck ever since. And as mm -hmm. a runner from high school, Michael also ran in high school, you know, it was like, you know, you ran the Island Champs. You, you won a race or finished second. You were the best on Staten Island. It was like, oh, it's just the public schools and just the Catholic schools or the privates. It was everyone. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we all banded together, a group of about 20, 20 of us. And the first year we did a race in honor of Bill Welch, the legendary runner. And the second year we did Judge Mike Brennan. And the third year we did Michael McVeigh. And last year, we split something where we did a dinner roast for Doc Campbell, the great podiatrist on Forest Avenue, and for Arnold Obie, who was a longtime Wagner College basketball star who's run like a whole bunch of New York City marathons. And uh, through my great friend, Tony Galata, we've been able to um, have world-class runners join us for these races. And so in the past, we've had Rod Dixon, mm -hmm. the 1983 New York City marathon champ, who you met. Last year, we had the Olympic champion in 1972, Frank Shorter. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, this year returning, he was here in 2015 for the Brennan race, but he's coming back now, is Bill Rogers, the four-time winner of the Boston New York Marathon, who I know we'll discuss in a little while. Mm -hmm. But I, I believe Michael and I would definitely agree that were it not for people like and Steve Zimmerman, mm -hmm. uh, Vincent DeRosa, uh, Daryl Peterson, uh, Marty McGowan, uh, <laughs> help me fill out some names here. I don't want to leave out some on. people. But we have, a really, yeah, we have a really great group of people who have selflessly given their time for making these races and events massively successful. And it's also led to friendships. Bill Rogers, in an article in SI Live recently, <laughs> talked about how he's looking forward to meeting these people, including this year's honoree, the crazy Staten Island running madman, oh, right. Tommy Hart. Amazing. You know what's interesting about the Staten Island running community is that running generally tends to be a very individualistic mm -hmm. sport, mm -hmm. where you're, 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 you are your own worst competitor. But 
Interestingly enough, they're also able to get together as individuals collectively to do things for the greater good. I'll give you a perfect example. Uh, Whit Halley and Bill Allert, when I was with New York City Parks five years ago, came to us and asked for a 5K running trail in Clove Lakes Park that was world class. Now, most runners, you would think they go out there individually, they, they, they run on their own, and then they go back home, and then they go on with the rest of their life. But these guys, uh, including others, took, their took the time out of their day to approach the Parks Department, to lobby for funding, to get that funding, and now are watching this trail be uh, transformed through capital dollars to make a world-class running trail that's going to benefit people other than them, which is incredible. So hats off to the running community in Staten Island. I hope right. they call in because, you know, we're yeah, giving, yeah, dropping well, all we, these names yeah, tonight. We, we need some yeah. phone calls. Yeah. So. Well, I, I just wanted to ask, what makes running so popular on Staten Island that it's not circuit through the other boroughs? Um, I, um, I, I wouldn't, I would say it's more popular than the other boroughs, but it's, people are more aware of it because of the size of the population or half a million people. And you, and we're sort of a small community, you know, in a, in a big town, you see runners everywhere. You can't help it. They're sort of congregated around, uh, you know, different parks that we have in the borough. So I don't say it's more popular here, but it's much more visible. And the, the, the population of runners are much more active in terms of their community than others. I'm seeing so many different people from all walks of life running in some way right down my neighborhood, <laughs> in the parks, even, well, even um, as close as the, uh, as the ferry. Right. And I it, see people running, too, when they're robbing something. Well, I, I don't know what neighborhood <laughs> you're from. But, uh, <laughs> I think we're good. But you know what's interesting, Jamie um, and Hector? Um, some of the people who have done this for years have become like our institutions. Mm -hmm. um, we are honoring uh, two people at our race on Saturday. Uh, the original running club post-World War II was called the Staten Island Harriers. Mm -hmm. And the Harriers uh, were created by a guy named Vinnie Hutton. Um, to be on that club, and this is like the 1940s and 50s, you had to run close to five minutes a mile up to distances of 5K. And every Saturday morning they get together and do like a three-mile run hard and eventually they made this called a handicap situation whereby word of honor, let's say I ran a 21 minute 5K and Michael ran an 18 minute 5K, I would get a three minute head start on Michael and whoever crossed the finish line first would be the winner. And these were immensely popular. And then around 1967 when the Staten Island Athletic Club was created mm -hmm. by Joe Jones and Bruce Selman, it eventually evolved into the Staten Island Athletic Club three mile fun runs now. And with all the Harriers, Many of them, unfortunately, have moved on, mm -hmm. um, but two of them are still with us, Tommy Hutton, Vinny's son, and uh, Mr. Kelly, I, uh, I always call him. <laughs> and mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Kelly is 92 years old, and he said movement is still the key. And, is he uh, still running? Uh, we'll find out on uh, Saturday, but we, wow. we, we're having a Harrier's Veterans Day walk, mm -hmm. about 200 yards, and uh, they'll definitely be part of that. And Michael Brennan always brings up something, which, you know, we talk about the boom. Um, Bill Kelly was the race director for the Thanksgiving Day Lou Molly run for 15 years. And in that era, yeah, you had about maybe 70 runners show up. But when Frank Shorter won the gold medal in 72 and then Bill Rogers came along, all of a sudden for poor Mr. Kelly, there was like 600 people at the race. Amazing. And he turned to the young Mike Brennan and said, I can't do this anymore. Please, you do it. And that's exactly what happened. Now, we should probably be clear Michael Brennan is probably Judge Michael Brennan, correct? Yes, ju Judge uh, just retired recently. Mm -hmm. Judge Emeritus. Yes, that's yes. right. And right. it seems like he's wearing so many different hats. Not oh, only is yeah. he with the racing club, he, he belongs to, I think, the ancient order of, order of Hibernians. Yes. He belongs to a few veterans clubs. Yes, he's a big advocate for the veterans, huge. Um, the veterans court that's coming here mm -hmm. was a dream of his mm -hmm. uh, for many, many years where help can be given to these people who have, you know, served our country overseas and come back with a lot of situations, which, you know, um, Mike Brennan feels that the court, while should, should have justice, mm -hmm. should also um, be willing to help these people at the same time and show compassion. Mm -hmm. And if you really think about it, the veterans who fight in these unreal situations, which I think the three of us can only imagine, mm -hmm really do need as much support as possible, without a doubt. What does that say to you that a guy who's such a busy man with so many different activities can still contribute time to running? He's passionate as heck. He won the 1959 Staten Island 100-yard championships in high school. 
Wow. And the feeling of getting that award, knowing that you're the fastest runner on Staten Island that year in high school. I think it's just feelings that we all have that have kept us all going mm -hmm. in the sport. And by the way, his wife, Olivia, who does help him, mm -hmm. um, on May 21st, a Monday night at the Staten, we are roasting Jack LaGrecci, the owner of the Staten. Yeah. Wow. So, and like I said, the money we raise from the races and the roasts go to the Brian Kiwanis Foundation. Mm -hmm. And Kiwanis is a word that's just symbol, is synonymous with children. Mm -hmm. Okay. A lot of it does go to the Staten High School Track and Field Association. But we've also donated in recent times to uh, the Boy Scouts. Um, other youth groups on Staten Island, you know, uh, giving, making sure that uh, youth track gets awards. Uh, the Triple Crown, which Bill Allard um, with Sidetrack sponsors, you know, make sure that they have the awards, especially for the kids. So we're really all about the kids. And I'm very proud, our group of these great people. I mean, we've raised, for the Staten Island Track and Field High School Association alone, we've raised over $75,000 Wow! since 2014. And more hopefully will be coming in on Saturday, where we're going to be honoring our residential madman, Tommy Hart. And Tommy is a <laughs> Vietnam veteran. He's a veteran, um, Gulf War veteran. Um, Tommy is 71. He refuses to stop running despite his hip replacements, knee surgeries, his stent, and his quadruple bypass. Oh, He's run over 100 marathons. And I hope, Tommy, you hear me. I try <laughs> calling you. You better call in. <laughs> <laughs> and he's just insane and uh, just like he's run marathons in almost every continent, including the Antarctic Amazing. Marathon. And he ran the Great Wall of China Marathon, 26.2 miles on the cobblestones of the Great Wall of China. They actually have a race they have a ra the Great Wall? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, like these are crazy. And Tommy wears these outlandish costumes and all these things. So the race is called the Tommy Hart Superhero 5K. Mm -hmm. We're encouraging people to dress as a superhero where all finishes will be getting awards. We have... Um, First female male plaques. Uh, the first female is getting a plaque in honor of Tommy's late wife, Carol. And the first male is getting a plaque in honor of the late Staten Island Sports Hall of Famer, Art Hall. Every finisher is going to have a Tommy Hart medal with his likeness on it. And we have a committee that's going to be set up, led by Judge Brennan. And I believe the artist Scott Lebedo is going to show up. Where we're going to oh, judge the best male costume and female costume. Mm -hmm. Where the prize will be, a for each of them, a $200 gift card to the Sneaker Factory running stores in New Jersey. Nice. So, you know, so we're encouraging people to please wear some stuff. And uh, we might be getting an appearance by the Grace Foundation down there, That's too. That's good. So a lot of good stuff. Uh, let's delve more into the race. How many participants are there going to be? And also, what is the location going to be? So uh, it'll be Saturday uh, morning. I think the kickoff time for the 5K is around 9 a.m. Uh, we anticipate anywhere from 100 to 250 people. It's all weather dependent. You know, the running community makes a game day decision usually that morning if they're going to show up. But we expect a, a nice crowd. Um, and what's the location? That's Clove Lakes, Clove, Clove Lakes, Lakes Park. Uh, the, you know the old stone house is, uh, or mm -hmm. Stonehenge? That's where you show up there, you sign in, get your bib, and then we'll line up and start the race there. Can any racers of any age it's compete? Open. Absolutely. Absolutely. Everyone from... The youngest to the oldest, walkers, runners, maybe even a baby stroller if we're, if we're feeling nice. good about it that morning. And it's uh, rain or shine. Yes. Where Just like football, can the, yes. the running races are like the NFL, rain, hail, sleet, or snow. Yeah. So. What is the best part about orchestrating a race like this or even in participating in a race like this? Oh, uh, I'll let Michael go. Well, I, I mean, I think that the, the thing that draws people to running generally, one, is, you know, for their, for their immediate health, it help, obviously helps them get better, get fit, feel good about themselves, conquer some medical and health issues. But I think more importantly, what we see generally is that people like the socialization piece of running, that they mm -hmm. go to a place where they're not being judged based on how fast they are, what their time is, what they look like, and they're being applauded for for getting to that start line and then coming across the finish. And it doesn't really matter how quick or how slow you are, it's the fact that you've finished. It's that journey that everyone is applauding. And I think, I know that that's what drives me to run, uh, to be a, you know, not only a good role model for my kids, but for my own health, but to have people sort of celebrate the fact that I've accomplished something that, that Saturday. And um, I think that's what will draw people out and I think it's what keeps people interested in the sport of running. You generally, you see people lose touch with this with their sort of health and wellness in their 20s and early 30s and then in their mid 30s they come back to it or they discover it for the first time like me i was a you know jeff gave me a little too much credit i ran track for about six months at wagner high yeah, school that's still good that's still six good. months <laughs> was probably you know that mm -hmm. it, it's about as long as i could do 
But uh, I came back to it in, in my 30s to, uh, to get healthy, to lose weight, to, and to be, a, more importantly, be a role model for my kids so that they thought that it was always okay to get sweaty and run and be active. But, um, but along the way, I figured out that there were other things, benefits too. There's a whole community out there of runners who are supportive. There are ways for you to give back through running, which we're talking about today. And ultimately, I landed at the New York Roadrunners about two and a half years ago, which really helped out, helped me find a place where I could give back to the community, all five boroughs uh, around the country and across the world. The Roadrunners are doing some incredible things, blazing trails, starting new, uh, new ways of running. We have virtual running now where you can run anywhere in the world and at the same time be running with people in New York City. It's a, it's a brave new world out there. But um, in the end of the day, I think people will show up on Saturday because of Tommy Hart and Jeff Benjamin and all the, the crazy kooky characters that are out there. But ultimately, it's to come out to the park, have a good time, you know, and then, and then go on with the rest of their day. Right. Well, I want to thank Michael because he just synonymously linked me with Tommy Hart. So uh. <laughs> I did say crazy, kooky people. That's okay. Yeah, I'm going yeah. to include Jeff in that. Yeah, well, you know, we all are. He is the mayor well, we, of running. We, we definitely all are. But, you know, so. Michael touched on something that was really, really interesting to me, and that's the fact that certain runners uh, take a break from it for a while and then return after Correct. a certain amount of time. What keeps a runner for lack of a better word, in the race without ever quitting or stopping? Well, I think that there's many things that motivate folks. The one thing that will take them out easily enough is an injury. So I know for me that's the, some of the reasons why I've taken a break. Or, you know, you're moving from one house to another, which we experienced recently. But I think what keeps them in the race is that sort of steady improvement in the way in which they feel they're losing weight, they're feeling healthy, maybe they're, they're moving their way from a 5K to a 10K to a half marathon, maybe the TCS New York City Marathon one day. I think th that progress is what drives people. But more importantly, I think it is really sort of the, the positive feedback that you get that every time you show up at the race and you cross that finish line. And there are other reasons why people do it. They run to uh, commemorate folks that have passed in their lives. They run because they've uh, defeated cancer or some other illness. They run because they want to be a good role model to their child, or they run away from Jeff Benjamin. <laughs> 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 I'll tell you a quick story. So Jeff, as you can see, uh, uh, he, lo he loves to talk about running. I'm the type of guy that when I run, I struggle with it, and it's never easy. But there was one race where we ran in, in Bloomingdale Park one winter, and it was a January. It was bad enough that it was cold out and that, you know, I'm like barely able to breathe. But I had Jeff running and narrating the entire 3.1 miles. It made it so much easier because it took my mind <laughs> off of all the struggles and all I listened was to Jeff storytelling. It was yes, really and then, awesome. Then you out kicked me like Rod Dixon. At the Jeff end, Smith I did. It's probably the only time I will ever beat <laughs> Jeff <right>. Benjamin. <laughs> I do have a question. Well, a couple before I leave, and that is, how do you recruit people, or how do you get the word out so that people can join you guys? And what's the process of well, being the, able to join? Just there are a few clubs on Staten Island. Um, the big one is the Staten Island Athletic Club, with the president is Kristen Golat. There's also the Richmond Rockets. Uh, the president is Toby Beagle Massa. Um, they're basically the big clubs on the island. Um, they have base of operations. They're on the internet. They're on social media. They announce meetings. Mm -hmm. Both clubs are more than welcome to accept any kind of uh, members, uh, beginners, intermediates, experts, elites. And, uh, you know, they're always willing to give advice and tag you along. I, I honestly feel I, I, got, I received my beginnings a bit um, with the Stan on Athletic Club three mile fun runs at Clove Lakes. Mm -hmm. The mm -hmm. Santa Athletic Club Three Mile Fun Runs at Clove Lakes are every Saturday morning at 9 a.m. They are free. All you have to do is show up, sign a waiver. The only time they are canceled is if there is another race on Staten Island that weekend. Okay. Like, for example, our race is this Saturday, so there's no Santa Athletic Club race. If there's a 5K, 5-mile, five 3-mile race at Wolf's Palm Park or the Conference House Park or um, street race, the fun run is canceled. So mm -hmm. that's the only thing you have to like look out for a little bit if you want to go. Mm -hmm. um, the race is a double loop, which means that the first time around is a little bit more than a mile and a half, and the second time around is the final total of three miles. But you know, if you're a beginner, 
You can always just run the first loop and go as you feel. And, yeah, some runners come down and can still bang out like 16 minutes for three miles, wow. which is 520 a mile, which is pretty good. But if you look at the results online, you'll see that there are people there who run 38 minutes for the three miles, mm -hmm. which is, you know, 12 minutes a mile, 13 minutes a mile. Um, some people go, you know, 45 minutes for the three miles. You know, they're there to do it. And if you want camaraderie, you're looking for something different socially, you don't put a number on, there's no pressure. It's a fun run. Amazing. So, Do you think running is more mental than physical or physical and mental? Uh, I'll, I'll answer that. Actually, I think it's a combination of both. Um, uh, generally, when you train for a race, if you, know, if you have your eyes set on a 5K, you have to put in some work for that. If you want to do a half marathon, you have to put in some work. But I will tell you that last, last June, I went out to Seattle for a conference related to work, and they just so happened to have the rock and roll Seattle half marathon. And I had probably trained a little too, not enough miles to get me to a point where I felt comfortable. But during that run, I am convinced that it was mind over matter, that in my head, my body just kept telling me another mile, that next flagpole, that street sign. And I kept going and going. And at the end, I ran the entire 13.1 without stopping. Wow. And, and I was not prepared for it. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that I, my mind drove me to finish. And just to, because that was the goal. To give up was not acceptable in my mind. So I think a lot of it is mental. I think getting, just putting on those sneakers and getting out the door is probably half the battle. For a lot of folks. My last, my last question is, before because I'll call back later. But um, how do you prepare for uh, as a beginner? How should you start preparing for a marathon? <laughs> for a marathon. Well, I, yeah. I, I, or not even just to get yeah, up. To um, a, my race. my suggestion would be is that obviously this would be a long term goal. You you want to give yourself a year, especially if you're coming from a non fitness situation. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, maybe Michael would agree, but I would think ten minutes a day. If you can talk while doing it, you're doing fine. If you're unable to talk, you're huffing and puffing. You're running too fast in those ten minutes. Right. The goal is for you to run, walk the ten minutes, and hopefully build up. You know what's interesting, Doctor Ted Strange. And there is a Dr. Strange on Staten Island. Mm -hmm. Ted Strange, Dr. Strange. <laughs> yes. Staten Island who has run a lot Hospital, of marathons, right. Staten Island University Hospital. He has a monthly column in the Advance right now for beginners. Um, I believe the third column is coming up this week to prepare for the Memorial Day race, which is Staten Island's big race, Staten Island Advance Memorial Day run, which is four miles. Um, his columns are online, so you, know, you could search Ted Strange SI Live Memorial Day run. And from a medical standpoint, what's great about Ted is, is not only are you getting the medical, but you're also getting the physical. Because he's a runner. He's run all these marathons. So he's teaching you not only the physical part, but the mental part. But the word that we've always heard is the talk test for beginners. Mm -hmm. The talk test means is that in your early stages, you are just getting your body ready. The aerobic is building up, you know, eventually a foundation. And if you're able to talk while doing it, no matter whether you're running 15 minutes a mile, and if you're really gifted, you're running five minutes a mile and talking, you are laying the base of your foundation, which will lead you with endurance later on to other things. So, but consistency is the key. Yeah. And like Michael said, getting the sneakers on is definitely half the battle. Yeah, I think uh, getting the right footwear is, is important. You know, everybody has different needs. Yep. Your body changes as you get older, so make sure you find the right, the right shoes. I also think that diet has a lot to do with it. What you put into your body is what you get out. And I know that firsthand. Um, you know, the, when I'm not eating well and I go out for a run, I definitely feel it. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, a lot of people, they're, they're, they try to lose some weight before they really start putting on the miles because it does impact your knees and your ankles. Mm -hmm. um, and also, you know, funny enough, dressing the part, wearing technical wear, you know, something that breathes, that allows you to feel comfortable while you're out there is very important too. If you feel like a runner, you look like a runner, you're amongst runners, you're going to feel like you're part of the club. It's, it's going to, psychologically, it's going to keep you excited and keep you in the game. Yep. Excellent job. And, and it's funny because, you know, we had mentioned Bill Rogers, our guest. And uh, Bill's a remarkable story because all those qualities came together for him to not only just enjoy running, which he does, but made him the best marathoner in the world mm -hmm. in the late 1970s. And uh, I know you wanted to ask a couple of questions about Bill. Yeah, so, I do. You know, a great guest who will be here Friday night to stand on Hilton from 7 o'clock on and then mm -hmm. uh, Saturday morning for the race, which he'll be running. Before I continue, Hector, did you have anything else for us? Uh, no, just one last one, then I'll split. Uh, have you ever came up with someone that had a running addiction that he <laughs> runs himself to death? 
Well, you never had anybody run themselves to death, but um, if you do decide to train too hard, too fast, you will make every orthopedist and every podiatrist very happy. And, uh, <laughs> you know, we've, we've seen some people like that, I guess, in our travels. Yeah. Um, you have to really discipline yourself and be very smart. Um, if you read about these great runners who run 150 miles a week, you know, yeah, but that's all they do is run. Uh, in today's world, they're professional athletes. They eat, sleep, drink, and run. Mm -hmm. So if you're working and you're on your feet, it's not really advisable for you to run 150 miles a week. Mm -hmm. So, you know, but great well, question, that's Hector. Me for the most time. Well, Hector, excellent job, first of all. Second of yeah, all. Yeah, I know my running. <laughs> there you go. Uh, definitely uh, join us next Monday night, I hope. Yes. All right. Take I'll care, Hector. Later. Bye. Thanks, Hector. Hi. I do have quite a few questions about Mr. Rogers. No, not that Mr. Rogers. <laughs> the Mr. Rogers that you speak of so eloquently. Right. Tell me about the day you first knew about Bill Rogers. I wasn't running, but I remember watching the 1979 New York City Marathon. Mm -hmm. I just remember there was this runner, Kirk Pfeffer, from Sweden, I believe, and he took off like a madman. And I had never watched the race before on TV. It was on Channel 5 and uh, just local broadcast. And Bill Rogers came and caught him in Central Park with two miles to go. And passed him. I remember saying to myself, boy, that guy's a smart guy, you know? Amazing. And then um, as I got in, when I did get into running, um, I met Bill for the first time in 1982 in Garden City, Long Island, among a throng of thousands of people. I mean, you know, even now he is bombarded with well-wishers and fans and stuff. Jim Wagner, who used to write for the Staten Island Advance, wrote an article a few years ago when Bill was here where we believe he might, have, he might be the one sports figure who signed more autographs for people than anyone who's ever lived. Because mm -hmm. he's never turned people down, he doesn't charge money for the autograph, you know, sign race numbers and all this other stuff. He never says no. Amazing. So, yeah. And through the years, like I said, the running world is so small that, you know, anybody can involve themselves in it. Where you can be in a regular race with an Olympic champion. You know, and the Roadrunners has done a phenomenal job with that. You know, uh, they put on, like, let's say the New York City Half Marathon that's mm -hmm. run through Times Square. And you're running in races with the best in the world. You can't wow. do that in baseball, football, basketball, hockey. You mm -hmm. just can't. You might mm -hmm. be able to go to one of those fantasy retirement camps <laughs> and do it with them <laughs> later on. But, you know, you're part of the action. And I think that that's another reason why people like to do it as well. Mm -hmm. But with Bill, um, Bill was an outstanding high school runner in Massachusetts. And in college, he went to Wesleyan College in Connecticut. And his roommates were Amby Burfoot and Jeff Galloway. Jeff Galloway made the 72 Olympic team. Burfoot uh, would win the 68 Boston Marathon. They're both very dedicated. Mm -hmm. Bill was the younger guy in the school, and he was Amby's roommate. Bill, Amby would go out for his 20-mile long Sunday runs, and Bill would be, uh, I don't want to use the word, I'll, I'll use the word partied out from Saturday night, and maybe join him for the last 10 miles, 5 miles of the, ra of the run, just finish. And um, Bill saw Amby doing this stuff and going, yeah, okay, you know. Um, Jeff Galloway, yeah, okay. Well, Jeff Galloway later on made an Olympic team in 1972. And uh, when they graduated, Bill was kind of by himself. And he said, he goes, I just gave up on running, you know? And uh, for about a five year period, four year period, he was smoking Winston's. He oh, had his wow. gin and tonic. That's not and good. Wore a leather jacket. Um, tumultuous time, the 60s and 70s. He was wandering. He had no idea what to do. Like Michael said, a lot of people leave the sport, sadly, who have been in the sport like 21 to 28 years old. And Bill just had a moment where he was like, what am I doing? And he watched, he watched the Boston Marathon as a spectator in 71, saw these runners run by who he knew. Mm -hmm. And he was like, and the best thing that ever happened to him, his motorcycle got ripped off. So now in order for him to go somewhere, he had to run. And so he realized that he loved the movement. He loved the movement. And three-year period, he's gradually built up. And there were failures in there. But in 1975, he shocked the world and won the Boston Marathon, setting the American record and stopping five times in the race to either tie his sneakers or drink water. Amazing. <laughs> yep. By the way, on this night, we're definitely taking some phone calls at 718-727-0143. So if you're a running aficionado or a runner yourself. Or you just want to make fun of us. Or if you want to make fun of Michael and Jeff. Go for it. Definitely yeah. call in. And I already got the signal from Kenny. That's another thing. Kenny Graham's on the other side of the glass right now. We I already like have it. a phone call. So, hello, you're in the bleachers. Hello, yes. Hi. 
Hello, yeah, it's, it's Bill, Bill Rogers, just friend here. Hey! Oh, wow. yeah. Speak of the devil! <laughs> Bill, yep. you're going to love this. Um, we might be getting a call from somebody else about 7.30. <laughs> oh, but that's all right. Go. How's it good. going, brother? Good, good. All is good. All is good. I was listening to your talk there a little bit, and, and uh, I think it's all true. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Even about the leather jacket? <laughs> yeah, what about the leather jacket? Yeah, do you still have the leather jacket? <laughs> no, I actually I, I sold it for like 50 bucks to a good friend, Bobby Hodge. Oh, Bobby who, Hodge who was, was a great runner. Oh wow! <laughs> From Great Boston Track Club, and he he um, I don't know what happened to it. I'd buy it back if I could. It was a good <laughs> luck thing, you know. <laughs> oh boy, <laughs> Mr. But, Rogers, I must ask though. Uh, yeah. My name is Jamie Hickson, and uh, it's a real yeah. honor speaking with you. It was good talking to you. Thank you. Was winning Boston or New York? the highlight of your running career? Um, you know, I was, I was lucky I moved to Boston. I'm from Hartford, and I, even though my teammate, Andy Burfitt, won Boston and everything, I didn't really understand what it was like, what the marathon was like, until I was right there, right in front of my face, and I said, wow, this is, this is intense, you know. <clears throat> and it took me a year or so to get going, you know, the whole thing um, with my motorcycle and all that. But... Um, but uh, I think making the Olympic team was very, very important. It still is important to uh, any athlete. And um, so, so that was my goal, sort of. When I won Boston, I suddenly had that chance. That's what happened for me, you know, in 1975, way, way back, 40-some years ago. But uh, I, I think it was just, you know, when you see a road race, you see a race, uh, any race, it, it, it could be a marathon, it could be a 5K, like this Tommy Hart race. You're motivated to move yourself, and that's what happened. I started to change and want to go back to my roots as a, a young runner, you know? Do you have any advice or words of wisdom for young runners who want to get to that next level? Yeah, definitely. You know, really, you can't. The main thing is running really is a team sport. <clears throat> and, and, you know, and Jeff knows this. Or every runner, once you get going into the sport, you, you usually join a running club. And uh, I, at first, I joined the Boston YMCA, YMCA, which was right around the corner from, from where I lived, uh, near the Boston Marathon, then got back into running a little bit on their indoor track. But then I joined the BAA, the Boston Athletic Association. I started to run outside, go to the road races, you know, it's really just just do it, like like that shoe company says. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it's really true. I mean, it really is true. You you feel better when you move. It can be walking, it could be running, um, but uh, swimming, cycling, whatever. You, but you have to kind of love what you're doing. And I had run as a young high school runner, and then in college. <clears throat> but for me, it was always a feeling of running with your friends, your teammates. And then that kind of got, I thought, well, it's over. You know, it's time for me to, to move on in the world. And it is a tricky time, you know, around you know, when you're getting out of high school or college, what are you going to do with your life? What's going on, you know? And, uh, but I was very lucky that I had that, that background. But anyone can run a walk, you know, and be a, or be a part of the sport. You know, just like in the Tommy Hart race, you have all these different people doing different things <clears throat> to make this happen. And, and that's, that's, that's running. It's a very simple sport in some ways. And uh, I, to this day, I still think it's got, it's got everything. It's got everything. Cool. Tell me about making the Olympic team. What was it like for you representing your country? Oh, oh first it was nerve-wracking nerve -wracking going to the Olympic trials. They only take three. And I think there were about 100 of us or 80 of us in the start line. One of whom was my very good friend, Tom Fleming, from Bloomfield, New Jersey. Who, uh, you know, we later raced together for 20, 30 years together, you know, and a good friend of Jeff's. And so you're on the line, but the tricky thing was the Olympic gold medalist was an American. That was Frank Shorter, the guy who kicked off the national and international running boom. And, and you know, how can you beat this guy? You know, he's got a gold medal and... But I figured another fellow made a move along with Frank and tried to run away. 
you know, but but the whole idea was I just ran kind of behind them, you know. Actually, I got a sight ache when that happened. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. But um, it was exciting. It's uh, intense. But, to, but Frank and I started to race together a little bit, and not against each other so much as with each other, and you work with your, with your teammates. It's just like running cross country in high school, you know. <clears throat> you work with your teammates, you run together, and you get strength from the other runners. That's what running is really like, you know. But to make the team, wow, all this up high as a kite, you know, it's just exciting, unbelievable. You can't really describe or put it into words, but, um, yeah, I was, that was, you know, you never forget it, really. Do you do you have any funny stories that you would like to share about Jeff Uh-oh. or Michael? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Is that, can I answer that too? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Jeff, Jeff has, Jeff has the, the power of an Olympian. He does. He's uh-huh. got this psychologically and mentally, he, his love of the sport. I was talking with my girlfriend Karen today, and she was talking about Jeff and saying, he really, really loves this sport and how much he has given back to this sport and helped build it as a journalist, you know, and a teacher and a, kind of a coach and, and everything from, you know, seeing Bill Walsh come in at 87 years old um, in a road race and, 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 and we went over and ran in with him. You know, you never forget the coaches and the leaders that were there way back. You know, because our sport has tremendous history, just like any other. And Jeff knows that, and he's really kind of. I think that's why you know he 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 tried to do things like um, uh, promote the events on Staten Island. You know, runners like Art Hall, who ran there and you know represented the area, and and uh, helped me get back into the New York City Marathon when I almost keeled over one year. <laughs> mm, right? Yeah. Yeah. Art Hall. <laughs> yep. Yep. So. Now, you're going to be uh, in town, if I'm not mistaken, for the big race that's taking place yeah. at Clove Lakes Park this Saturday. Yeah. What do you yeah. have the most to look forward to regarding this race? Um, you know, I'm going to be there with a good friend, Joe Martino. He's a lifelong friend, you know, Great 40 guy. years. And he's a longtime runner from way back. And he ran in the first New York City Marathon in 1970 when there were only 120 runners or so on the starting line, you know, just think, today, 50,000 runners, biggest marathon in the world. So he kind of helped build that marathon, along with uh, Tom Fleming and, and Gary Murky and Fred Lee Bowe and the New York Road Runners Club. And so it's exciting times, the first running boom, but I think it, it never changes. It's always always a great sport. And um, But I'm looking forward to uh, meet Tommy Hart again. I've met him before. This race is uh, saluting him, and, and we hope that everyone will come out. It doesn't matter how slow you are. If you've never done a race before, you know, get your shoes and come on out, and we're going we're gonna to run walk, uh, you know, uh, and salute Tommy Hart. And it, I ran in the park before, you know. I'm not in great racing shape, you know. I'm 70 years old now, but it kind of doesn't matter your age in this sport. It, it's like have no fear. Uh, let's 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 just get out there and, and uh, enjoy the the beauty of that park and and, and the good day. You started out at a time when the marathon in this city was in its infancy. Now mm-hmm. we have the marathons in Bean Town, like you mentioned, also yeah. also Chicago, Los Angeles, and London. Yeah. Why has the marathon grown so much in all the years uh, that it has? You know, a lot of different reasons. I think, you know, when Frank Shorter took that gold medal in the Olympic Games in Munich, Germany, all of us runners, tr- former track runners, cross-country runners, high school, college, post school we we're watching TV. It's the Olympic Games. Two billion people watch the Olympic Games every time it comes around. Every four years, it's just... I had seen the Olympic Games in high school. I saw Abibe Bakila, the great Ethiopian, take the gold. And here's an American winning. It hadn't been won since 1908 um, when Johnny Hayes took the gold in London Olympics, 1908. And um, it, it was just earth-shattering. And, and I think everyone said, you know, here's an American guy. He just, he just went out and he just started pushing and pushing and doing his best. It was like Rocky. You know what I mean? That 
TV show, but here's the real Rocky. It's really true. And, uh, and uh, so it was exciting. And I think, um, I think Fred LeBeau and the New York Roadrunners Club, you know, had, had started the race in the park. But to put it into the city, into the city was the big move. And it was a big gamble because, and, and, and lots of us were wondering, can this work? Is someone going to get hit by a car? You know, I hear in a big city here in New York. And, and, uh, but I ran that race in 76, and it was absolutely exhilarating running through the city streets, you know, and, uh, because you really felt that you were, it was like cross country. It was like running cross country in high school. You know, when, when you're really duking it out and you're going over hills and around turns and, and the surface of the road is, is a little bouncy and it's like, this is the nitty-gritty. And that's what I believe Amazing. New York is to this day. Right. Bill, Guys, if I do you could, have any yeah. last words for us? Well, if, I, if I could just interject, um, Bill's yeah. aware of this too. Our, our great pal, Tony Galata, his father, yeah. who was a chief engineer for New York City, helped design that five-borough course Amazing. in 1976. Oh, yeah. it's, it's amazing how the sport comes full circle, right, my friend? Absolutely true. Yeah. Absolutely so, true. Yeah. Always any, that way. Any last words for us, Mr. Rogers? What's that again? Sorry? Do you have any last words for us? Uh, just I want to thank Art you know, for helping bring me in and Jeff and the team there, the Qantas team. And um, I love what, you know, you've got a great leader in your community in Jeff and, and you know, the development of the new track there. And uh, just that, you know, as you get older, you, you, you're, you're not, you could be competitive, but you just want to celebrate a little bit too. And that's what part of running is all about, you know. And um, so I'm looking forward to meet uh, the young high school runners, the older runners, um, like Bill Welsh, uh, Michael Brennan, uh, Bill Jankunas, Olympian, you know, in the high jump, Montreal Olympic Games, uh, teammate and everything. You never forget those days, but I want to see the new young people. When we support our young people in the U.S. today, they always come through. So if, if some of them will come out for the race, you know, Jeff and I are going to run along and, and cheer them on, you know. Mr. Rogers, this has been such an honor. Uh, thank you a lot. Thank, thank you, you so much for joining us. <laughs> And we're going to be seeing you on Saturday. That would be cool. All right. It's Thanks, Bill. Be, fun. be well, sir. Thank you. Park. What does that mean to you, getting so much praise from him? Hey, uh, he should be my agent. <laughs> 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 so, Michael, you're fired. <laughs> <laughs> I must ask, though, he mentioned uh, the young runners. Are there any runners that are competing? this Saturday that running fans here on Staten Island should know about? We're not sure yet because, like Michael said, um, some, sometimes the real hardcore competitors, it's like a poker game. They don't want to pre-enter. Mm -hmm. They'd rather show up that morning and enter. And, you know, like one thing I learned a long time ago from a Staten Island runner, Tom Cuff, who was a great coach but a really great runner years ago, Tom Cuff would always make his appearance at the starting line of a race, literally 15 seconds before the gun went off, so everyone at the line could look and go, oh, Jesus, he's here. So, <laughs> you know, so in the world of competitiveness, yeah, it, it's rare. Um, however, though, we've had Michael Cassidy run, who's the top New York Athletic Club Staten Island runner who made the Olympic trials a couple of times. And, uh, you know, we've had um, uh, Melissa Racido Craca run, who's a great local runner. Um, we're going to see. Well, you know, as we always say, you know, we hold the event and see who shows up. As far as um, runners in general, we've had racers like Frank Shorter mm -hmm. and also uh, Steve Prevontaine, who unfortunately was taken from us way too prematurely. Mm -hmm. And also um, nowadays Meb Caflezzi right, make right. their mark in the American uh, long distance running circuit. Right. Is there a young up and coming long distance runner that running fans or even uh, other ru runners should know about right. well, you that know, they I, should know about uh, down the road? I'll, I'll, I'll mention the male, and I believe Michael will definitely mention who the top female uh, runner is. I don't um, know if we know, if we're thinking the same person. Uh, I would think we are, hopefully, hopefully. But just so you know, we actually don't have an up-and-coming guy. We have a star. 
Galen Rupp, who runs for the Nike Oregon Project, yes. which is coached by Alberto Salazar, who's a three-time winner in the New York City mm -hmm. Marathon. And as a young boy, he trained with Bill Rogers and got mm -hmm. motivated when he saw Rogers run a Boston Marathon right by him. Um, Galen is the Olympic bronze medalist in 2016 in the marathon. Wow. Okay. And just last week, what happened was the Boston Marathon this year was like a torrential downpour, <laughs> whatever you want to call it, tsunami, rainstorm. And Galen had a rough day and dropped out. But Galen with Alberto got their training still. And this past weekend, he ran the Prague Marathon, I believe. And he won the race running two hours, six minutes, and 50-some-odd seconds. Wow. Which is a three-minute PR for him. So Amazing. it was a really spectacular performance by Galen. But Ga Galen, in the world of marathoning and distance running, is our best runner right now. You know, but my, Michael, so I, let's see if Michael. I'm going to throw out two names Jenny Simpson That's and Shalane Flanagan. Both oh, of them. So we'll start yes. with Shalane. Didn't Shalane. Jenny Simpson uh, also compete in the Olympics? Yes. Uh, yes, but so Shalane won, the, she was the first woman in 40, 38 years to win the female Open at the TCS New York City Marathon. Yeah, first of wow. all. In November, and it was a sight to behold. Yep. Amazing. Amazing. Uh, crossing that line, the tape, you know, and she just, she just was overwhelmed. To have, to see that firsthand was incredible. The other one is Jenny Simpson, who is I think the sixth time winner of the uh, Fifth Avenue Mile. Right. So she's more of a shorter distance, but she has competed in the marathon. She's also an ambassador for the New York Roadrunner Youth Program called Rising New York Roadrunners, and a wonderful person. Um, but there are others out there, and you know what's wonderful is that we're seeing a resurgence in American running in general. A few years ago, you probably wouldn't have said that, but you're seeing more and more of the Americans finishing in the top 10 of most of these large uh, world marathons and in the, the sh shorter races. And so I think what's going on is that, that th there's almost a third boom, I would say, of running. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, I, would, I would attribute it to around 2015, especially the Rio Olympics in 2016. Jenny Simpson won a medal. Um, a few other runners won, won medals besides Galen and Jenny. And the big one was Matt Centrowitz, who won mm -hmm. the 1,500-meter gold medal, the Former first American. Staten Islander. Yeah, well, maybe not. Well, how long did he live here for? Uh, well, the dad lived. The dad lived in the Bronx and Sweet. visited on Staten Island. But I don't know if young Matthew was ever he here. He might have driven through Staten Island. Yes. Which, yes. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll take, take, we'll take we, that. Yeah, we mm -hmm. take that. We take that. <laughs> um, but, um, but Matthew, who won the race, was the first American to win it since 1908. Wow. And he was kind of called a Chicago. Cubs runner because in 2016 the Cubs won the World Series and the last time they won was 1908 <laughs> and in the men's mile for the Olympic Games the 1500 I mean just like in baseball there were great teams there were great runners Jim Ryan and uh, Marty LaCorey and Steve Scott and Jim Spivey all phenomenal runners who never won a gold medal in the Olympic Games in that race and Matthew uh, exercised those demons as we like to say so, so speaking Amazing. of underdogs we should acknowledge City Field in the background mm -hmm. right. and underdogs you know our Mets <laughs> uh, yeah, unfortunately, yeah. they You're are. You're talking to the wrong guy. Really, well, yeah, you know. really, so. really <laughs> slumping you. badly right now. Yeah. And we just got the signal from Kenny that we have another phone call. So, okay. hello, you're in the bleachers. Yes, hi. My name is Craig Virgin, and I'm calling in. Hello to there, Craig. Jeff Benjamin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. C Craig, let me give you a little intro. Craig is one of the greatest American distance runners of all time. He's based out in the uh, southern Lebanon area. Um, wow. He, uh, well, le not Lebanon, the country in the Middle East. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> of course. Yeah, Southern Lebanon, I Illinois. Know, I want you to know that I live 26 miles from Bush Stadium. Hmm. And when the Mets, the amazing Mets, were in the same division, the East Division, with the Cardinals for years, they were our rival. <laughs> yeah, and, and um, there was a very bitter rivalry. <laughs> yeah. Well, but let me also say this, that we have a tougher rivalry. The Cubs. That is with the Chicago Cubs. <laughs> mm -hmm. we, just, we just swept three games with the Cubs as of last night. Last night was in the 14th inning, and Sunday, excuse me, Saturday night was in the 10th inning. So you can imagine all the St. Louis fans back here are popping their Budweiser bottles tonight. <laughs> yeah. okay? Any victory that they get against the Cubs is a, a major celebration. It has been very painful that the Cubs have won the Central Division for the last two years. You don't know how that goes down so bad back here in St. Louis. So, right. Well, anyhow, mm -hmm. and I'm sure you weren't calling about baseball, but I want you to know that baseball was my first love. And uh, when you grow up 26 miles from Bush Stadium, and when I was a kid, I would listen to Harry Carey broadcast for the Cardinals on my transistor radio. That's right. You have to understand, you have to understand that it's almost like a religion back here. Mm-hmm. Okay. 
If I'm not mistaken, Harry Carey was born in St. Louis, wasn't he? No, but he he broadcast here for twenty some years in the in the fifties and sixties, maybe even in the late forties. And his sidekick was another Hall of Fame broadcaster named Jack Buck. Yes, and Joe, sir. Both, we were we were fortunate here. St. Louis is a either a small, large, or a big mid-sized market, and and baseball is still king here. And mm-hmm. we were very very fortunate to have not one but two Hall of Fame broadcasters broadcasting our St. Louis Cardinals. And, of course, you know, things that Harry did, even though his style was unique to uh, different to than Jack's, mm-hmm. uh, you know, both of them evolved together. And if you're a young man of five or six years old the way I was and loved baseball, it, it, was, it was such a privilege to be able to listen to the transistor radio late at night. Th- these guys were every bit as good as Ben Scully. And I, I don't know the, 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 the New York broadcasters as well. But let me just say this, that the first World Series that I ever watched on TV or was really aware of was when the Cardinals played the Yankees to seven games in 1964. Hmm, and then they right. won it in the seventh game. And so the Yankees with Mickey Mantle and, and Roger Maris and, and other, other of those guys, I was such a baseball fan. And I'm very much aware. The only other two teams that have the same powerful tradition in baseball would be the Yankees or the uh, Boston Red Sox. Same I, I true. Up that. In the top three. I would agree exactly with that. Exactly true. Right. Hey, Craig, um, we just had Bill Rogers on the phone. And, um, you know, Bill, to, to introduce Craig to some of us in this audience, Craig was a phenomenal world-class runner as well. Um, the only American to ever win the annual World Cross Country Championships, a race that is held annually against the best runners all over the world, including the Kenyans and Ethiopians. Mm-hmm. Craig not only won it once, but twice. And Bill Rogers always said that that was equivalent to an Olympic gold medal. And wow. Craig, wow. Uh, the more I think about it, Craig should be an Olympic gold medalist in the 10K, but in 1980, the United States boycotted the Olympic Games. That's right. Right. But, but Craig, you, you competed against Bill Rogers. You beat him in a Boston Marathon. And, uh, you know, y- you guys are part of that, you know, time period of the boom. Well, the difference between Bill and Frank Shorter and I was that um, I was, uh, you know, those guys – didn't develop their stardom until after college. You know, Frank, uh, Bill for sure after college. Right. Frank Shorter became a star in his senior year at Yale. and uh, But I was a star from a sophomore, junior year of high school on. Yes, and he was, he was one of the best high school runners in America. Wow. You have to, you know, you every time you jump up that la- to the next ladder, you start at the bottom and you work your way down, and or you work your way up. And... So it's a situation where I survived moving from high school to college, from college to national, and from national to international. And I, I guess you could say I'm proud of that, you know, of being able to somehow survive all those transitional challenges that happen. It's the same way in baseball, going from little league to high school, high school to, 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 to college, or then to the uh, minors, and then be able to make the adjustment up. Right. There's a transition, and there's a challenge every time you step up to the next level. Right. And, and we, we had Craig on Staten Island as our guest a few months ago, and just a phenomenal, inspirational, uplifting man with an amazing story. Uh, I'll plug your book. Craig's book is called Virgin Territory, which I think people will remember. And the most amazing thing about the book is the last 10 pages where all more than – 500 of his world-class races over a 25-year career are listed. Wow. wow. Despite the fact that Craig endured amazing physical ailments, not even just running related. And he had surgeries as a child with a urological disorder and uh, survived that. And Craig, Craig just doesn't quit. <laughs> amazing. You know, and uh, I'm, happy to, I'm happy to announce that. You know, hopefully Craig will be our guest for next year's race in 2019, whatever that is and whoever that is. But um, we definitely want Craig Virgin here on Staten Island again. Craig, do you well, have I any have last practice. words for us? Well, I tell you this. I had eye surgery this morning. I'm sitting here Same. home from the hospital with a patch over my eyes. So I'm persistent enough that I'm calling into your show post-surgery. So <laughs> that's how much I want to be able to reach out to Staten Island and hopefully visit at next year's race. 
You know who you reminded me of? Remember that game Operation? <laughs> <laughs> He's like the uh, the poster child for the game Operation. Just take a little, like a swizzle stick or something, and, and just <laughs> stick it into a particular body part and try to take it out. Well, you know what? My mascot is the Ever Ready Bunny. I just keep going and going and going. And I'm a farm boy, and we just, uh, back here in the Midwest, us Midwestern farm boys have to be resilient. That's just how we survive that year. Exactly right. Craig, do you have any other last words for us? Well, just that uh, I've, I've been impressed uh, with what, uh, you know, what Jeff has showed me about the Staten Island and the community of itself. And if Jeff, if Beth, if, 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 if Jeff Benjamin can't bring Staten Island to the international and national running community, he finds a way to bring us to Staten Island. And he, he's a, he is a wonderful ambassador. And let me just say this. You guys are blessed. He has made a big impact in the national running journalism scene in the last two or three years through hard work and persistence and a, a never say no kind of a, an attitude. And if there's a way to get things done, Jeff Benjamin does it. And the other thing is, being a journalist myself, and I do freelance radio and TV work, I was impressed with Jeff's homework. He does his homework, he does his research, and uh, and so I've really appreciated and enjoyed getting to know Jeff in the last five years on the national running scene. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. So I don't, I don't know if my uh, high school dean, Larry Ambrosino, would agree that uh, <laughs> I do my homework. But <laughs> Craig, well, you're going been... to owe me either some seafood or some uh, <laughs> deep dish pizza. Deep dish pizza next time I come out there, Jeff. You guys, you guys are making yeah. me hungry now. <laughs> <laughs> Craig, it has been such a pleasure getting a chance to speak to you. Thank you so much for joining us. I look forward to joining you again uh, when I come back to Staten Island next. We'll do a preview show, okay? We would love that. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Craig. Thank you. To wrap up in these last three minutes, you mentioned something that was really, really important. And that's the fact that this sport has a lot of really good ladies and gentlemen. Whereas with uh, the mainstream sports, they come a dime a dozen. Why is that? I think when people get into running, they're not looking at the monetary edge. Um, my own humble opinion is, is that too much youth sports today is driven by parents who think that if their kid is the seven-year-old champion in Little League, that they're going to be able to sign a major league contract by 18 years old when, you know, the body has not even matured yet and neither has the mind. Um, I used to coach Newdorf High School, and I worked in some other programs before. I have found, at least in running, that colleges, a good college coach really doesn't look at anything until maybe their junior year, you know, junior year is key. It's funny how junior year is always, you always tell the kids junior year is key academically, mm -hmm. you know, in high school. But same thing with athletics, you wow. know. And uh, I don't know if Michael would agree with me. We've seen some great young talent in the sport mm -hmm. through the years where 99.9% .9 of them don't continue for whatever reason. I mean, one of the things so that New York Roadrunners is doing is uh, introducing long-term athlete development and physical literacy into Which is our great. youth programs that – you don't need to be competitive until later in life uh, when you have all those necessary skills and foundations set first. So you want to learn how to run, jump, fall, you know, all this, the skills you need for all the sports. Running is generally the backbone for all of them. So if you teach the kids how to do all those things first, everything else will come with it. And the other thing that we're looking at is whether it's a good idea for young kids to be running long distances. And, and I think generally most parents agree that it's not the best thing to set your five-year-old out on a half marathon course. But so Ro Roadrunners is, is going to take some leaps here and lead the field and start to address the issues that we see with kids get, getting too athletic and too competitive early on in the in the sports. So. Right. And Michael mentioned a great thing with that program because it said you're teaching other kinds of things there too. Like when I was a kid growing up, we played ball in the street, ran around, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I think our generation is as well. So, but listen, uh, Jamie, I know we're going off, yeah. but uh, we want to present you with. Um, Thank you. You are now an honorary member of Bill Rogers' oh, Staten Island wow. Running Crew, courtesy of Asics. Thank you so, so much. So please make sure you wear this at Clove Lakes on Saturday. I will and, wear uh, this. Enjoy proudly. it well. Yep. And if you want to turn it around really quick before we go off the air, 
our great organization, the Brian Kiwanis Club. Thank you so much, guys. Our pleasure. Our pleasure. I'm going to be seeing you this coming Saturday. Yes. You got for it. everyone here, for Kenny on the other side of the glass, and for Hector over the phone, I'm Jamie. Good night, everyone.